Thank you. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, to to um, it's an honor to be invited to uh, speak at the TED Med here at Columbia, and I have to say, as many times as I have stood nearly in this place in front of a podium to give lectures to medical students, um, this is the time that means the most to me. And I have to say, this is the most difficult act I have ever followed in my <laughs> life. <laughs> <laughs> because um, we're really going to change gears um, and talk about a very academic question. And it is one of the questions that um, I'm going to approach with a very academic point of view, a very traditional point of view, and share with you some of the research that we have um, recently uh, produced to ask this question, why is language so difficult for autistic children? But my talk is not without a personal story, too, um, although um, uh, we won't go into so much detail. But for those of you who have heard my lectures in the past, you know that I'm absolutely passionate about science. Science is very much an art form. We do this because we love the thrill of the chase, the thrill of taking a question and answering it in a systematic way, and in particularly a way that gives us some insight into a question that needs to be answered, a question that has value to all of us in our uh, clinical practice, in our caretaking, or our parenting, our lives in general. This is one of those questions. Why is language so difficult for autistic children. It is probably one of the most frequently asked questions of parents of autistic children, of caretakers, of doctors, of people that um, care about um, neurodevelopmental disorders. Autism, and I'm sure that um, it, many of you, all of you in this audience know, is a neurodevelopmental disorder and is characterized by mild to severe difficulty with language, as well as mild to severe difficulty with um, interpersonal interactions. However, we know very little about uh, the underlying, underlying neural physiology that um, relates to these disabilities. Although we know very little, we know something. And so my talk today is going to be about that something. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we've learned about the brain and how it works with respect to the underlying difficulties of autistic children. But before I start, let me tell you a little bit about the typical language system. Now, any of you who are medical students know this. But just for all of us, let's review. Language is a complex process, and it involves specific areas of the brain that work together in a coordinated manner, like a bunch of toolboxes that perform specific functions. And so we have an area that's associated with the primary auditory activities, the hearing, the gathering of the sound information. Another adjacent area called Wernicke's area, actually, that is responsible for the, the um, reception of language, for the understanding of the sound um, uh, components that are um, delivered by the auditory system. And then we have the frontal areas of the brain that are associated with the speech production. And so you can see that there's a constellation of tools in the brain that work together in a coordinated way in order to implement this complex process of language. In addition to these three areas, there are means by which they connect to each other. So we have a, a well-known pathway that goes from the back of the brain to the front of the brain. And that has a fancy name, a fancy medical name. It's called the arcuate fasciculus. But I like to refer to it as the northern root. And this northern root carries information from the receptive part of the language to the production part of the language. There's also another root. Um, and if there's a northern root, 
you can imagine that there's also a southern route. <clears throat> the southern route also has a, um, a fancy name, but southern route is sufficient. So the, the parts of the brain that um, really operate to produce language in a typical brain involve these three areas that I've shown here, plus pathways that connect them. The northern root pathway uh, is specialized for um, high level um, uh, uh, language processes, the communication of detail information and so on. Um, the uh, southern route here processes simpler information and oftentimes has a more emotional tone, more emotional information. So this is the entire system. So now we ask, what? What is wrong with this system when um, a child with autism is not able to learn to speak? to learn language. And so we begin, we look at this framework and we say, okay, this gives us a framework by which we can organize our approach to this question. So one of the fortunate um, uh, opportunities that I've had in the number of years that I've been at Columbia is that I've had some absolutely brilliant graduate students. And I have to say that we all as faculty know what makes good faculty and it's good students. And that's the truth. So the students do all the work and we get all the credit. And that's sort of how it, how it works, right? Well, this was a student of mine who did all the work. And I'd like to give her back a little credit. Her name was Grace Lai. And she's now um, a medical student at uh, UC San Diego. Uh, but she did her PhD um, um, studying uh, autism. And much of the work that I talked about tonight comes from the work that she did. So we began to systematically test what's wrong with the system. And the first thing that we um, asked was, is there anything wrong with the connections between the back of the brain and the front of the brain? And the reason for that is that there's a very popular hypothesis. It's called the disconnection hypothesis. And it simply says that, well, the reason that autistic children don't speak is because the back of the brain is not connected to the front of the brain. Well, fortunately, with uh, uh, contemporary imaging techniques, we can simply test that hypothesis. And so a standard structural image that just simply looks at the connections between these two areas um, is sufficient to, and it's not quite that easy. You know, when we give talks, we make things sound really easy, but it's not really quite that easy. But, but we were able to actually test the disconnection hypothesis and determine that amazingly that these structures were indistinguishable from that of the typical brain. And so the conclusion was disconnection wasn't disconnection at all, that there was another, uh, another reason. So the next thing we looked at was the auditory system. Is it true that autistic children perhaps don't hear the language and that's why they don't speak? Well, as it turns out that our lab and many other labs have tested for hearing difficulties in autism. And although there may be some normal variants with students or people that have difficulty hearing, that's not the problem either. Hearing difficulties is not, the not characteristic of the uh, typical autistic phenotype. So, so far, um, it, it all looks like things were working reasonably well. Now, let's see. Hmm. OK, so this guy here was our next candidate, Wernicke's area. Now, how would we test a single, single area of the brain um, um, with respect to its function with respect to language? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because, <laughs> of course, the answer is functional magnetic resonance imaging. That is, we simply put people in the scanner and we ask them to do things or hear things or see things. And we have the opportunity with the techniques in our hands to look at the parts of the brain that are actually activated during these specific tasks. And so we know that this area of the brain, the receptive language part of the brain, Wernicke's area, is specialized for processing and coding language. And so we did a study where we put autistic children and age map, match typical controls in the scanner, and we had them listening to recorded narratives of their parents. 
Now we know that children don't listen to their parents, but nonetheless, it was the best that we had. And so um, we were able to look at signals of these children um, uh, from this particular area. And when they were listening to language, we observed a very different signal type for the autistic children uh, as compared to the normal children, the, a, the typical children. I avoid that word normal, I try to. The typical children. Um, um, so so uh, we were able to find a substantial difference in signals in this area. Well, okay, so that's very interesting. So we ask, okay, so this is our first bottleneck in the, 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 the mystery of why is it that autistic children have such difficulty with language? Well, part of it is that the coding doesn't work in Wernicke's area. So, but we said, is this specific to language or is it specific to this area? So we tried some other auditory signals and we used uh, music. Well, what we discovered was that with respect to music, the, the area worked perfectly well. And in fact, the entire language system uh, worked perfectly well in autistic children. These are very severe autistic children uh, listening to music. And so there was something very specific about this particular area, uh, Wernicke's area, that um, was um, blocking the um, ability to code language um, information. And in fact, sidebar, my student Grace published a, a second paper suggesting that this uh, signal um, in Wernicke's area that was so depressed during language and not during music processing be used as a diagnostic for autism. Another one of the most uh, prevalent questions asked of parents of children with, di with um, autism or suspected autism is how do I know that this child has autism? It is diagnosed mostly by um, milestones that are missed during the, the behavioral development of a child. And these milestones are language milestones, social milestones, and so on. And by the time the child is diagnosed, it's, he, the child is oftentimes four or five years old, whereas the um, reduced signal to language processing um, uh, can be detected much earlier than that using um, uh, neuroimaging techniques. And so that was a, uh, a, a major finding here. So the, the answer to the question is that we know a little bit um, more than we did when we started about why it is so difficult for um, autistic children to learn a language. And one of the reasons is that there are coding deficiencies that are intrinsic to the autistic um, brain uh, that prevent the, or appear to prevent the proper coding of signals in um, particular area called Wernicke's area. Now, this is just the beginning. One of the things that I wanted to leave you with is a very hopeful uh, message that this, this research um, in autism is a, is a huge enterprise now. And we're beginning to actually come to some answers about what the fundamental mechanisms of autism are, how they work, and though this work at the moment remains at a descriptive level, that is, we try to understand what is broken in the brain, there's a great deal of research ongoing now that is looking at the mechanisms and their associated potential treatments. So, um, I would like to leave you with the message that one, we know a little bit more than we did a while ago about why autistic children don't speak. Two, we have some very specific targets now to, um, um, to uh, investigate and to um, guide us in our thinking about therapeutics. And so it's a very fast moving field and with some faith in research, we will answer some of these questions. Thank you.